Um, but basically what we're going to do is talk a little bit about um, schwannomas and not just vestibular schwannomas, which I guess um, obviously the majority, but some of the other schwannomas that we come across and that uh, other people come across who aren't otologists or uh, skull base uh, surgeons. Um, so I thought maybe you know, it might even manage to pique the interest of a head and neck surgeon if we were uh, really lucky, even though it's not cancer. Um, okay, so, oh, there we go, look, a um, uh, nice purple background. Um, <laughs> I am going to briefly kind of go over a little bit of the general stuff uh, about these tumours, um, including, you'll be surprised to hear, histology. Um, I guess, I'm assuming that the audience is sort of registrars uh, wondering about exams at various levels and perhaps some of my uh, colleagues uh, wondering what the rest of us get up to all day. Um, so basically I'll try and kind of cover a spectrum. Um, let me know if I feel like, if it feels like I'm getting the uh, level wrong. Um, but basically we're gonna talk a little bit about the, these things, what they look like, what happens, if you don't do anything, uh, what the risks of doing things are, um, and what the things we might do are. <laughs> How's that? Uh, I'm not really going to talk about predisposition syndromes. Um, uh, there's actually a, a registrar training day next month, um, and I'm going to talk about it then. So I sort of thought, well, I don't want to um, do, have too much duplication. So um, like everybody else, when the pathologist comes to the MDT and puts up uh, pictures of tiny little squiggly things with different colors, I think, what the hell is the point of that? Um, none of the clinicians other than the pathologist know what they're talking about. But nonetheless, I guess we should know roughly what um, the pathology is. Um, and actually that sort of scaling up from what they're looking at down the microscope to what you're doing uh, down your microscope in, is not so uh, far removed. Um, the main sort of histological point of interest of a schwannoma is that basically uh, these are like benign tumors that sort of arise from uh, a Schwann cell that's gone wrong. Um, so what happens is the, the, the cells sort of replicate and displace um, the structures around them. Um, and they, the whole terminology for these sort of nerve tumors uh, is confusing and confused. But essentially, most things are a schwannoma. So a neurolimonoma or a neuronoma are basically synonyms for a schwannoma. And obviously, People with neurofibromatosis type 2 develop schwannomas, but a neurofibroma is a different thing. So a neurofibroma does not arise from a single point and displace the normal surrounding tissue around it. A neurofibroma is a different sort of infiltrative thing with that basically uh, doesn't displace the normal tissues around it, but sort of invades it. So from the point of view of surgical treatment is completely different. And it's rather unfortunate that it gets all confused because, you know, people refer to neurofibromas thinking, well, if they've got neurofibromatosis, they must have neurofibromas. But basically, there are two kinds of benign uh, tumors affecting the nerves, neurofibromas, which are infiltrative and are not the subject in today's talk and schwannomas, which sort of displace and which are. Okay. So the relevance of that, here we go, more pink and purple pictures. You're all starting to go to sleep already. Uh, but basically, uh, when you cut a nerve, you know, that little white thing that you, hopefully, certainly if you're the trainees, hopefully you're not cutting. But if you find yourself in a situation where it does seem like a good idea and you cut the nerve, what you see is lots of little um, ends within it. It's a little, a little bit like one of those telephone cables, I guess, that you also don't cut, ideally, um, in that there are lots of little cables within. And each of those little cables is surrounded by uh, perineurium, which is this sort of dark 
layer here. So this is one of the little cables that you see when you cut the white thing. The whiteness is this epineurium that you actually, that's the bit you see. And plastic surgeons like to talk about putting perineural sutures in when they're stitching nerves together. But actually the stitches they're putting in are in the epineurium, which is the sort of layer around the edge. That's the bit that will hold the suture. Um, intracranially where there isn't an epineurium and there's just lots of perineurium is much harder to stitch because the, the perineurium doesn't actually hold a stitch. But anyway, a nerve is not uh, uh, one thing, it's got all these little bundles within it. And a schwannoma will only arise from one point within one of these bundles. Um, and certainly the other uh, bundles will be displaced uh, sort of relatively unaltered around it. The bundle that the actual uh, tumor has arisen in may well be kind of pretty um, distorted, but the other ones are kind of smeared around the uh, periphery. And this is relevant. That's why I'm mentioning it. So when I wrote this, I didn't appreciate all those little boxes down the side, but anyway. Okay, so essentially, if you look at um, a tumor, so here's a schwannoma in a nerve. This is a schwannoma that has been excised uh, old school with the nerve around it. Um, and so this is the outside. This is the looks sort of white. These are nerve fibers. Uh, and here is the tumor. And here is what a histopathologist would call the capsule of the tumor. But actually what a surgeon would call the capsule of a tumor is if anything, this bit that is around the edge. Okay, and that is relevant when it comes to how you remove these uh, things. So yeah, we're gonna come back to that. So basically, what do they look like on uh, scanning? Well, I mean, I think this is for sort of someone sitting their exam. And basically, they enhance with gadolinium. They're heterogeneous because they tend to have uh, cystic lower signal areas within them. Um, they're, I don't know, I don't suppose everyone's little people are sitting down the side there. Yeah. So um, if you can see the text on the right of the slide and you've minimized your little people, you will uh, see that it says there's possible correlation of growth with vascular permeability. So basically there's some exciting research now suggesting that we might be able to tell which one is growing on the first scan that they have if they have a scan uh, with DCE MRI. So basically a sequence that looks at vascular permeability and vascular permeability correlates with growth. So it may be the case that now or then in future, rather than getting a scan, finding a schwannoma, and then waiting to see whether it grows before the interval scan, you might be able to get uh, one of these DCE scans and segregate them into tumors likely to grow and tumors not likely to grow without having to wait. Um, so that would be nice. Uh, that's one of the things that is coming. It's not yet kind of clinically applicable, but it's, um, it looks like a, a technique that we will be using in a few years time. So uh, on a CT scan, the relevant thing about a schwannoma is that it will have uh, to sort of mold the bone by displacing it. So this is in contrast to a paraganglioma, which is often the differential. Um, which tends to have a slightly more sort of infiltrative pattern uh, to the bone. So the bone around a paraganglioma often looks a bit moth-eaten, whereas the bone around a schwannoma will tend to look uh, smooth and sort of scalloped. Uh, just to say, one of the things we're going to talk about through this talk is uh, SRS is now the kind of um, appropriate uh, um, abbreviation for the technique of stereotactic radiosurgery. And basically I am not gonna sort of pass judgment on which one of the toys that delivers it is the best one. Um, basically there are a number of machines, Gamma Knife, Cyber Knife or Linac. Um, they all do much the same thing. There are slight differences in, um, in the sort of physics of it. They're not, the radiation dose is not identical. 
but in, in practice it's much the same. Um, and essentially a cyber knife um, can treat things other than in the head, um, whereas both the gamma knife and the Linux based systems actually are only really suitable for um, intracranial or skull based disease rather than uh, cervical disease. Anyway, it's radiation which is basically delivered in a, a few big fractions, uh, which are very carefully shaped to match the tumor rather than lots of little fractions. Um, so up to five counts as stereotactic radio surgery. Um, uh, normally one or three are the choices, but whatever. So what's the natural, the natural history of all of the different schwannomas wherever they are is much the same. So they're all things which will uh, tend to grow slowly um, with a small chance of a relatively sudden uh, or relatively abrupt growth and a very small chance of a kind of overnight um, changing in size, which is something that we don't normally mention uh, to the patients at least because it might just scare them. But um, Basically, sometimes people bleed into a tumor and get sort of acutely unwell. Uh, it only tends to happen to people who are all on, you know, uh, warfarin, rivaroxaban, whatever, something that makes that predisposes them to sudden bleeding. But, you know, just occasionally someone will, um, who's had a, a tumor that's being watched, will sort of suddenly come in, you know, acutely unwell because they've bled into it, particularly if it's intracranial. Um, but normally we play down that small risk, uh, just as the risk of malignant transformation of a schwannoma is extremely low. Um, and it is a risk which exists irrespective of whether the tumor has been irradiated, it is slightly higher if they have been. But either way, it's you know so stunningly rare that it's basically not worth scaring people by talking about it. Okay. Um, the tumors can, uh, a lot of the tumors will remain static or spontaneously involute. There is sort of debate about whether a tumor which has been static for some years has the potential to late to grow. And I think, again, the answer is yes, it does have the potential to grow, but it becomes progressively less likely the longer it's remained stable for. So you reach a point where you say, well, look, this really isn't worth uh, watching. Uh, in terms of the functional deficits associated with schwannomas, um, they may again be sudden onset or gradual. There's no, you know, it's, it's the fact that someone has a sudden center in your hearing loss or a gradual onset of hearing loss does not, um, there's no, no sort of pre predictive value. Uh, or similarly with the loss of function of other cranial nerves. People sometimes present with a sort of Bell's type picture of a sudden deterioration in facial function uh, who have a uh, schwannoma. And even if their function improves somewhat, uh, it doesn't mean that that wasn't the cause. I, I think it's worth sort of stressing that the schwannoma the, or the loss of function in the nerve that a schwannoma is growing from tends to be related to the schwannoma growing within a point where it is constrained. So um, basically, if you have a schwannoma growing at a point where it is not uh, constrained by bone, it is very unusual to get a functional deficit associated with it. It's not impossible, but it's unusual. So the fact that they're kind of on nerves going through the skull base tends to be associated with um, the function deteriorating. Um, ah, okay, the exception being obviously that uh, intracranial tumor growth will often distort other nerves intracranially and sometimes those nerves cease to function. So. <laughs> sort of an exception, but it's not the nerve of origin, it's a different nerve. So, for example, the only kind of deficit that actually correlates with growth from a vestibular schwannoma is uh, facial numbness arising because the trigeminal is being stretched across the top. Um, and similarly, actually, if you have an, a schwannoma that's not a vestibular schwannoma, but is stretching the 
eighth nerve, then the hearing loss will tend to correlate to an extent with the amount of stretch on the nerve. So uh, just to sort of illustrate that here, uh, the, the obvious thing that illustrates the idea that maybe um, the functional deficit relates more to pressure within a confined space than to volume of tumor is for a facial uh, schwannoma. So here is a young guy I look after who has a pretty large um, facial schwannoma. So he's got a basically looks very distorted, big lump displacing his ear and sticking out uh, under the skin over his parotid, which is a facial schwannoma. But the tumor does not extend into the um, fallopian canal and his facial function uh, remains perfect. He looks like his skin is about to break down over the top of this thing, but um, his face is still working perfectly. But classically, you see lots of patients with tiny little uh, facial schwannomas arising near the geniculate ganglion, which is their sort of classic um, spot, who often have terrible facial function. So here's a guy who basically has a complete facial palsy. He's had a uh, a temporary less transfer or lab a procedure to reanimate his face um, and he has this I mean I hope you can all see it this little thing just in the lateral within the fundus of the IAC and the geniculate ganglion so a tiny little tumor but uh, surrounded by bone and hence you know clearly exerting significant pressure um, on the nerve so that you know the volume and the uh, function do not correlate at all. Um, so in general, I guess there are some risks associated with having a strong uh, a schwannoma, particularly if it's going into your head, we tend to worry about your brain getting squashed and the hydrocephalus. Uh, but if that is not a concern, i.e. it's not extending uh, intracranially, then you tend to worry mainly that the nerve the schwannoma is growing on will uh, stop working eventually. Um, or that it, the pressure, it'll exert pressure on other nerves. Uh, and then sometimes people feel the thing is uncomfortable. Uh, occasionally people will present with things like obstructive sleep apnea from a parapharyngeal mass. Um, and obviously lots of people don't like having a, a, a lump in their neck. Uh, although, you know, in the scale of things, that's not really um, a major worry. So we'll talk a little bit, basically, I'm not really going to cover the trigeminal brachial or brachial plexus ones. We'll talk a little bit about vestibular schwannomas because obviously they're the most common ones, facial ones because they're sort of uh, challenging and some of the lower cranial and uh, cervical um, schwannomas. And they all, the sort of management for each one is quite different because the risks and the sort of pros and cons uh, are quite different. Um, but I guess we have to start with vestibular schwannomas because that is the vast majority of schwannomas. Um, and they arise from basically the vestibular bit of the vestibular cochlear nerve. Um, I probably ought to know why that is the case, um, but I'm afraid I don't. Uh, it just is. Um, I, I, if someone in the audience um, can concisely explain why it is that the vestibular nerve is so much more affected than the others, uh, I'd be uh, delighted to hear. Um, sorry, I'm just tweaking this little thing. Okay. Um, there is a classification system for vestibular schwannomas, um, which I'm, I can't say I particularly find helpful. I mean, um, but essentially, you know, there is a marked difference between a tumor that's causing brainstem compression and with significant distortion of the brainstem and a tumor that's not. Um, and the management does roughly vary according to those um, classes. Um, so typically these things will present with or either as incidental findings or as a sensory neural hearing loss. Um, 
I believe that tinnitus uh, as an isolated factor is not uh, predictive of the presence of a vestibular schwannoma. So they sure they may walk into your clinic saying, oh, I've got tinnitus, but the reason they've got tinnitus is because they've got sensory neural hearing loss. Um, if they have tinnitus and they don't have sensory neural hearing loss as a reason for the tinnitus, then I think it's very unlikely that they have a schwannoma. In fact, on the now extremely old study that I did um, on this uh, with Johnny Harcourt, it seemed like uh, tinnitus in the absence of a uh, hearing loss was in fact less associated with um, the presence of a schwannoma than, than the patient having nothing. I think it, because it suggested a slightly neurotic patient and maybe that's a not politically correct um, assertion. But anyway, People with unilateral sensory neural hearing loss um, you need to be screened for a vestibular schwannoma. Similarly, if they have vestibular hypofunction, if they tend to veer to one side, uh, you know, consistently kind of clipping uh, one side of the door, that kind of thing, they, they tend to veer to the uh, affected side. Obviously, if they've got facial numbness, that suggests there might actually be a tumor that's uh, um, going to warrant some treatment because it implies uh, distortion of the brainstem and the root entry zone of the fifth nerve. And then you get, uh, I mean, this is the sort of the order of uh, sort of severity, uh, as in, um, you know, it, a tiny thing might be incidental or present with sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, by the time they've got raised intracranial pressure, they wake up with a headache every day, their vision's gone blurred, um, and they can't sort of move their arms and legs, then they've probably got something quite bad uh, or large um, growing in their head. Um, and then there's this Hitzelberger sign, uh, so, which is uh, a numbness of the skin of the ear uh, canal, which is sort of, um, I don't think anybody's ever come in, I've never seen a patient come to me saying, look, my ear canal's gone numb. Um, but you do sometimes notice it when you examine a patient who's got a vestibular schwannoma. And then the other symptom that I sort of hesitate to mention and that's not classically associated is pain, but it is the case that quite a lot of people or a reasonable proportion of patients with vestibular schwannomas um, find they have a sort of deep-seated ache on that side, presumably as a result of dural irritation. Um, but I would not sort of spin it around and say that it, anyone who had an ache um, needed the scan. But it might just be another one of those little factors that sort of chip in. So that if the patient's got unilateral tinnitus and a sort of deep-seated earache, you know, and a little bit kind of imbalanced, even if their hearing test was perfect, I might be persuaded to get them a scan. Um, the symptom that they present with is not the same, irrespective of exactly where the tumor is. So basically. Patients who have a relatively laterally placed tumor, which is the ma majority, so the ones that arise in the IAC, will be most likely present with a functional deficit from um, the nerves within the IAC. So hearing loss uh, and therefore tinnitus or uh, vestibular symptoms. Um, whereas uh, those who have a tumor that's arising re relatively medially would be much less likely, as in the thing about that you know the nerve stops working because it's uh, in a confined space so the the me and more medial tumors tend to grow to a much larger size and then present with sort of facial numbness uh, headaches you know kind of weakness dropping things that kind of thing uh, and those are obviously uh, presenting at a later stage and a bit unfortunate um what happens if you don't treat a vestibular schwannoma well um the concern, of course, is that the tumor might just keep growing, squash their brain and kill them. Um, it's not necessarily clear that that would happen, uh, even if a patient has a small but growing tumor. You know, some of them will stop of their own accord. Uh, and some patients will die of other things, particularly during a pandemic. Um, so, you know, they don't necessarily all need um, an intervention. Um, but if you sort of say, oh, well, you know, we're miles away from a severe brainstem compression and death, let's not bother. Uh, again, particularly during a pandemic, I guess. 
um, then you know there are the risks associated with treatment when they need it would gradually increase. They may get numbness. Um, you know the, the sort of likelihood of them having some other sequelae from their eventual treatment will increase. So, you know, one doesn't want to sort of put it off to the last minute. I uh, would suggest that the hearing loss, the correlation of hearing loss with size is pretty poor. Um, so, you know, we can't use that as any sort of marker. But the, really the rules, you know, the amount of thought that goes into the decision about a vestibular schwannoma treatment is um, limited. The, the rules are hold pretty uh, fast, which is basically that if a tumor is not growing, uh, there's no point doing anything. Um, if a tumor is um, intracanalicular, it doesn't matter if it is growing, it's still not worth doing anything. So basically there's no point springing into action when you see uh, the tiny spot within the IAC become slightly less tiny. It, it may well stop on its own and the risk associated with it getting bigger is negligible. But if there's a tumor within the cerebellar pontine angle, which is getting unequivocally larger, so it's not just the marginal error on the scans, uh, then it probably should be treated. And there's not a great reason to uh, defer that and let it get bigger still. So basically, once you have unequivocal growth of this CPA component of a tumor, you should probably treat it. And it, it's a reasonably, uh, uh, so basically when we talk about m measurements of vestibular schwannomas, we just measure the bit in the angle. So you, you just measure the bulb of the light bulb as it were, you don't measure the, the uh, bayonet cap. Um, so if that bit measures less than two centimeters, pretty much invariably, they're gonna be advised that they should have radio, radio surgery, even if they are young. Uh, and if that bit is uh, more than three centimeters and therefore likely to be causing significant molding of the brainstem, they're probably better off having uh, surgical treatment, both because the radio surgery becomes technically much more complicated to deliver and because the success rates of it go down and the complication rates go up. If the tumor is uh, between two and three centimeters in the cerebellar pontine angle, then those are the ones where there's a little bit of debate uh, about what the best treatment is. And you might uh, be influenced by other things. Um, the patient's age, uh, to an extent, one may feel slightly more wary of irradiating a younger patient. Um, and the particular configuration. So basically, if it's um, more like a rugby ball uh, with a maximum diameter of uh, two centimeters, you'd probably irradiate it. But if it was more like a football, uh, one might feel there was more concern about brainstem compression or distortion and uh, consider surgery more prudent. Um, don't think there are any other relevant sporting things. Discus perhaps you could irradiate. Anyway. Um, other indications for surgery. So uh, disabling vertigo. So basically it's a funny thing, but uh, patients who are very disabled by vertigo uh, will tend to get significantly better when you remove the tumor. In fact, you'll often find them up wandering around pretty shortly after their surgery in a way that someone who didn't have vertigo would certainly not be. So uh, you're effectively sort of switching off the ear with the tumor in um, and you know, that seems to work surprisingly well. I'm always a little bit kind of wary of that as an indication, but in practice, it seems to work well. We went through a little phase of giving these people gentamicin to think, thinking, well, we can just ablate the function rather than putting them through an operation. But actually that just didn't really seem to work nearly as well as just removing the thing. The other um, possible indication is pain. Again, rather controversial. Um, I think there's no doubt that some patients do find uh, the presence of a tumor applying pressure to the dura, a source of pain, uh, but they may well just be people who are not very well good at coping with adversity um, and therefore perhaps not the ideal candidates for surgery. 
So anyway. Um, hearing preservation. Um, uh, so basically, uh, in some countries, uh, or in fact, <laughs> in most countries, um, people think that actually it's a good idea to take out a tiny vestibular schwannoma as soon as the person, patient presents to your clinic because um, it will only become harder to preserve their hearing as the tumor grows. And also, if you don't do it, they might go to someone else who will do it, and then you'll have missed your operation. Um, in the UK, we would say that that, that is not an indication for surgery. Um, if the surgery is otherwise indicated, you know, if there's someone that has a large growing tumor or, um, you know, significant vertigo or whatever, and you want to do it, well, sure, you know, you can preserve the hearing if you want to. Um, but the evidence would suggest that even if you do manage to remove the tumor and preserve their hearing, the preserved hearing will generally deteriorate over time. And the assumption is that the reason that happens is because that one has compromised the blood supply to the cochlea. Um, it's slightly disappointing often, or not often, but occasionally we feel really clever having removed the tumor and preserved hearing. Uh, and then a few years later, it sort of um, no longer looks like such a great trick because it's faded away. Um, the middle fossa approach is uh, one of the two approaches used for hearing preservation surgery. Um, and basically it's the best approach if you want to preserve hearing whilst removing an intracanalicular tumor. But as they seldom meet the criteria in the UK for a tumor needing to be removed, uh, it's very rare for uh, UK surgeons to end up doing middle fossa approaches. In fact, you know, there's this national vestibular schwannoma audit and pretty much nobody does a middle fossa approach on it with any sort of um, consistency. A uh, retrosigmoid approach um, would be slightly preferred if the reason that they have hearing worth preserving is that there isn't much tumor in the IAC. Um, and that is um, relatively widely done. Um, there is a sort of thing in where there are some centers in the UK that would say, oh, we only do this or a retrosig or we only do a trans lab. Um, I think a better approach is to say, well, you know, we'll tailor the approach to the patient, but uh, there isn't really a right answer. But it, basically in the UK, if you're doing hearing preservation, you're almost certainly doing it through a retrosig. Um, so when we used, uh, the way that, um, uh, I was taught how to uh, do this was um, we didn't basically used to bother doing hearing preservation, even in retrosigmoid uh, approaches for vestibular schwannomas, because it was felt that one compromised the um, view of the facial nerve in order to try and preserve the cochlear nerve and that bearing in mind the hearing probably wouldn't last anyway, that wasn't wise. So basically uh, the way we used to do it is that we would uh, debulk the tumor on the brainstem and sort of roll the tumor forwards until you could see uh, the eighth nerve coming off the stem. And actually the seventh nerve comes off just in front of it. So it's sort of obscured. Your view of it is obscure, obscured by the eighth nerve. So we used to just cut the eighth nerve to, in order to have a lovely view of the seventh nerve and then peel the tumor off the seventh nerve. But basically a few years ago, we changed uh, that and the practice now is to preserve the uh, cochlear component of the um, eighth nerve um, which does slightly compromise your view of the seventh nerve but in practice you end up leaving a little film of cochlear nerve between the tumor and the and seven which if anything ought to improve your uh, preservation of the seventh nerve rather than um, uh, endanger it. And then the other bonus is there's this nervous intermediate that provides um, secretor motor to fibers to the lacrimal gland. And often people, even if they have perfect facial function after vestibular schwannoma surgery, where you've divided eight, will have a dry eye, which sounds like a sort of trivial um, thing, but it can be quite annoying. And really, um, you know, if we can preserve that as a bonus, 
um, well, you know, why would you not? So, um, so basically, what is better, a retrosigmoid or a trans lab approach? Well, um, a retrosig uh, is generally a bit quicker. Um, although once you allow for putting the patient in this sort of park bench position, which is basically lying on your side, it doesn't, and all the time faffing around, it, there may not be a huge amount of difference. It allows you to preserve the hearing because you're not drilling out the um, labyrinth. Um, and it doesn't really matter if they've got a horrible mastoid or a sclerotic mastoid or ear disease um, because you're sort of staying well away from their ear. But you do um, end up having to move the cerebellum a little bit to get at the tumor. Um, so you can leave uh, what is described as a footprint. Obviously, it's not a foot. Um, but the cerebellar function you know, may be a little bit compromised, and that's not ideal if they've also lost a bit of vestibular function. Um, and what you don't generally do is get a nice clear view of the facial nerve um, laterally in order to be able to sort of peel the tumor away from both directions. Um, the trans lab approach um, gives you good access to the lateral end of the facial nerve uh, and you don't make any sort of footprint. So particularly in a young person with a sort of fuller head, um, sadly it's true, um, you may rather not be applying any traction onto uh, or retractor onto the shower bone. You don't really need a retractor for long doing a retrosig. Once you've drained a bit of CSF off, everything tends to slump, um, particularly in the elderly, better at slumping. Uh, but um, you do often see a bit of a footprint. Okay, so basically what we tend to do is um, if they've got immediately placed tumor, there's not much in the IAC and they may well have better hearing. Well, you know, why not do a retro SIG? And if you can preserve the hearing, that's a bonus. Um, if they have more tumor laterally and worse hearing, well, you know, don't bother. It's not worth preserving and you'll get better exposure through a trans lab. So here is someone who, hmm, I'm gonna minimize these little people down the side again, um, who, basically had uh, a retrosig. He's got a sort of part solid, part cystic tumor, which doesn't have a great deal uh, within the IAC. And he had a retrosig and preserved um, hearing unchanged. This is just, these are a few of the cases just from recent um, months. Oops. Um, Oh, and the other thing I guess is with a retro sig is um, well, look when you have a tumor like this that hasn't really extended into the IAC, you don't you might think it's a vestibular schwannoma, but you don't necessarily know for sure. And in fact, this one turned out to be uh, hemangiopericytoma with the nerves draped over the top of it. Um, so the fact that we didn't go through the labyrinth. Um, so his hearing was unchanged. I mean, it was took a long time to get out, but it was better off treated by a retrosig. So there's that extra little element of uncertainty. Uh, and in those cases, one again might prefer a retrosig. Um, okay. Sorry. So, so again, you know, patient with a tumor that basically doesn't extend to the IAC, it looks like a vestibular schwannoma in terms of all of its enhancement and its location. Uh, but could it be something else? Well, yes. And the patient has good hearing. So, um, you know, maybe better not to sacrifice that by going through the temporal bone. On the other hand, you know, uh, here's a decent sized tumor with a relatively decent bit going into the IAC, um, you know, why not just go straight through the ear? There's rubbish hearing anyway. Um, you get a better view. And obviously, posterior fossa are quite full, not only because there's a big tumor there, but because there's, you know, the brain is not um, atrophied. Uh, and this again, same sort of thing, um, you know, tumor, 
filling the IAC, uh, the plane of access through a translab will just be better. So, and so you'll notice that all of these tumors are quite big. So basically, hopefully, the, one of the take home messages is that, you know, we don't operate on people with little tiny tumors. Um, they don't need it. It's an unnecessary risk. Um, people with tiny tumors do not need to be referred urgently to see somebody because they have tiny tumors and they don't need any treatment. Um, that's another point perhaps worth um, making. So, um, sometimes you might want to do a retrosig because it's quicker. Uh, sometimes you might want to do a more destructive op operation in order to say ablate uh, balance. Um, and sometimes the mastoid uh, status makes a difference. Okay, so I think that's about all you need to know about vestibular schwannomas as, uh, as any sort of trainees. Um, facial schwannomas, okay. So generally arise at the genicular ganglion. Again, not quite clear to me why. Um, the genicular ganglion obviously has um, uh, cell bodies in, but not uh, the cell bodies of the motor bit of the facial nerves. You know, they're, they're the sort of sensory uh, and um, secretor motor bits, um, special sensory, whatever it's called. Um, so I don't know why the tumors tend to arise there. Um, we do quite often see them extracranially. Um, if they were to arise in the cerebellar pontine angle, they might be mistaken for a vestibular schwannoma. And occasionally people take out a vestibular schwannoma and a patient ends up with a paralyzed face and they say, oh, I think it was in fact a facial tumor. And sometimes that is even true. But it's very hard to, you can't really tell unless it's extending um, along the facial nerve further laterally. But basically, I think the vast majority do arise at genicular ganglion, an area which is very um, encased in bone and hence uh, often associated with quite poor facial function despite being very small. So the primary concern when you're managing facial schwannoma is not that the Uh, there's a range of things. Um, make a bit of space so it's not pinched. Um, sometimes we put in cross facial grafts that are ready through the early stage. So that as their facial function deteriorates as a result of tumor growth, their uh, other side takes over. Um, you can treat these things with radiation, but obviously that will cause swelling within a confined space. Um, some uh, series have been reported of uh, people removing the tumor whilst preserving function. Um, and the traditional thing was to resect with an interposition graph once they got to worse than a grade three. So traditionally, people went straight from one, which is conservative, to step two, uh, resect the tumor and put in an interposition graft, um, ignoring all the things in the middle. But I think that's probably not current practice. So essentially, if the tumor is within the bony confines, we would, and they have a clear deterior, progressive deterioration in facial function, the normal uh, next step would be to decompress it so that uh, there is room uh, for the tumor to grow without function deteriorating. Um, and then once you've decompressed it, you might say, well, now that there's room for it to swell if it wants to, perhaps we could consider radiosurgery. So that's more what we would tend to be doing now rather than the interposition and put in a cable graph, uh, resection and put in an interposition cable graph, which just doesn't tend to work terrifically well. Um, and obviously we had those slides earlier. Oh, let me just, uh, where were they? So basically for these guys like, oh, uh, with the big, um, here we go. This chap who has a facial schwannoma, obviously um, it's peripheral. So it's not suitable for interposition really any cable graph because uh, the lat far end, there's lots of different little branches. His skin is starting to break down or looking very kind of thin and red and he wants something done. So that is one where 
um, one might consider a sort of cautious intracapsular enucleation type treatment, which is essentially finding that plane between the fascicle that the tumor's developed in and the other nerve fascicles and trying to just remove the tumor whilst preserving the other fascicles. But um, that's not uh, something that you'd rush to do. Right, where were we? Okay, and then lower cranial nerves. Uh, again, there is a classification system for them uh, described by Sammy. I don't, I'm not sure it's very helpful. But essentially, these ones are in a way a kind of combination of everything because, um, you know, often they present with oh, the, the ones you might worry about more, the ones with a large intracranial component. So some of them, you, you're you not really worried about the nerve. That's uh, a, not the major concern. The major concern is their brain being squashed. Um, some of them, you're worried about the nerve function deteriorating because it's going through a bony foram foramen. But unfortunately, one that's got other things in it um, and is perhaps a little bit less easy to sort of decompress, i.e. the jugular foramen. Um, and some of them are just arising in the neck where they're not actually uh, going to squash anything until they've grown an awful lot and perhaps have grown to the point where they're extending into the jugular foramen, which obviously does happen. But, you know, you've basically... Um, your concern is more about the fact they've got a lump that they don't like and maybe it's a bit tender. So they kind of cover the range. Um, oh, there we go, same statement. So this is a guy just been referred um, who has a uh, probably vagal schwannoma. So you can see it's got a large cystic component in the cerebellopontine angle. So he presents with a sensory neural hearing loss. In fact, since this scan, he's developed uh, headaches, which initially were just on waking, which is a classic thing for uh, raised intracranial pressure, and they're now um, continually present. So one would assume that this cystic component has probably continued to grow and he will be uh, having surgery shortly. Um, there is a solid component. So look, this is the internal carotid artery. This is the uh, jugular bulb, sigmoid sinus. And this is the cystic bit of the tumor and the solid bit extending uh, into the pars nervosa of the jugular foramen. So sort of between those two. Uh, and there you can see uh, it sort of coming down in the temporal bone. Mm. Slightly less obvious even, I'm afraid. I couldn't tell exactly which bit's which. Um, and here, this is a non-contrast sequence, but there you see the tumor coming down uh, it, through the jugular frame. And in fact, there is a little bit um, uh, just in the top of the carotid sheath. So nice um, scan, not very nice for him. Um, but I guess it illustrates, you know, the idea that, you know, it's not great to obstruct your jugular foramen and there's a risk to the other nerves from the tumor, solid bit of tumor growing in there. But it's even worse to squash your brain from the bit of cyst that's growing up. And, and so he presents with sensory neural hearing loss rapid onset because his uh, cochlear nerve presumably displaced uh, superiorly there. But now he's also got the raised pressure type symptoms. So, um, so how do we manage these things? Well, uh, basically um, for someone like this, you know, who's got symptoms of some uh, raised pressure in the head as a result of a large cystic tumor, um, the appropriate step is to address that risk by a retrosigmoid craniotomy. So a little cut in the bone about here and one about here with him lying on his side, drain a bit of CSL, let that cerebellum settle down uh, and basically um, open up this large cyst and, and, and sort of um, remove as much of the cyst wall as is possible whilst preserving the nerves that are draped around it. Um, the solid component of his tumor could be removed. You can do what's called a, a, a POTS tumor, a POTS procedure, petrooccipital transsigmoid approach. So basically drill out the mastoid, uh, ligate the sigmoid and extend that, that incision sort of uh, either side basically to get the whole of the jugular frame and, and the posterior fossa all exposed. Um, but we don't normally end up doing that. Normally we would say, 
uh, remove the cystic component from the top and uh, gamma knife to the solid component uh, inferiorly because it's kind of hard to remove the solid component inferiorly whilst preserving function. Whereas if you have a uh, tumor which is just um, cervical, it's actually relatively easy to remove the tumor whilst preserving um, function. So although the stakes are much lower with the tumor in the neck in that the nerve is unlikely to stop working until it's grown all the way up to the jugular foramen. Um, it's also a much easier thing to treat because in the, in the neck, you can basically winkle the tumor out of the nerve whilst preserving the function of the nerve, which is a good trick. Um, the higher the thing gets to the skull base, the, the kind of harder it is to get a really nice exposure and the risk of uh, getting some sort of functional deficit does go up a little bit. Uh, and strangely, the sympathetic trunk schwannomas, uh, which are often hard to distinguish from the vagal ones on imaging, um, it's probably slightly harder to get the tumor out of the nerve without causing a functional deficit. But of course, the functional deficit, a Horner's syndrome, is uh, less uh, morbid than uh, a vagal palsy. So basically, the threshold for intervention has to vary with the risk associated with the intervention. So something like this. So here is a, uh, this guy was, I don't know, 21, I think. Uh, we did manage this conservatively initially, make sure we could see that it was growing, but it's a, it's a nice little tumor in the low in the neck, very accessible, perfect uh, vagal function, of course. Um, but that, is both pre and post removal of the tumor, which was on the vagus or within the vagus, I should say, rather than on because it is sort of inside the nerve. Um, this isn't him, this is someone else, but this is essentially what you end up doing. You expose your little kind of um, tumor with a bit of nerve running into either end and then essentially sort of sweep over it until you find, let's just go back a little bit, that little kind of thin, you see how the knife is just sort of separating a thin, uh, film and you just you do this at an area that's not stimulating and then essentially you kind of fold back that uh, edge that little film of nerve that's around it and then you can kind of turn the thing inside out and sort of deliver it from this this is the the, the surrounding nerve that has been stretched around the tumor that is sort of it, it comes out of and then you remove that sort of thing and you end up with a nerve that's sort of stretched into a bag as it were so that is the nerve um, which has been stretched into a sort of thin flimsy bag around the tumor but you only have to make one sort of cut in it uh, in the uh, length along the length that the nerve fibers are running um, at an area that doesn't really stimulate where presumably there are less of those uh, fascicles um, and then you can sort of winkle the tumor out um, and I mean, that is a technique that this guy, uh, James Netterville um, from Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville um, popularized. Um, and he wrote up his uh, series, you know, in his result. Well, I don't know if they say, eight of them had normal vocal cord function from the vagal tumors, <clears throat> but 15 had normal voice. I don't, I, I guess, you know, I don't know exactly how he's defining those things. But he also found his sympathetic trunks uh, were harder to preserve. But in our series uh, so far, uh, I've done nine vagal tumors and seven of them have had normal vocal cord function, all have a normal speaking voice, but one uh, struggles to sing. Um, and of the sympathetic trunk ones of five, two have uh, a horn is one of which um, has now resolved. So that seems pretty good. So actually we're not doing uh, badly compared to Netterville, the kind of uh, father of this um, technique, uh, perhaps more uh, luck than anything else. Um, but, was, but essentially um, it's a very big change in the management of these things because they always used to just be left. Now there remains lots of stuff in the literature where 
it, it's not quite clear what people are talking about when they're talking about intracapsular nucleation and they talk about uh, subtotal resection, you know, only suitable for the elderly trying to preserve something. I don't think that that's not what's being done at all in that you, the whole of the tumor that is removed, but it's just in a, a plane that's that much further in. So it's in the plane that's inside the other fascicles, but outside the, what the histologist would describe as the capsule. So it's inside what the surgeon would describe as the capsule, but outside what the histologist would describe as the capsule. Um, the, the little bit of residual, you may leave some residual disease because obviously there's not a robust uh, tough layer around the outside. Um, and the risk is that really that you leave a little bit right at the top, particularly in the tumors that are going up into the jugular foramen. Um, but if you do leave a tiny little scrap there, you could just be zapped. Whereas normally these tumors are too big to be treated with SRS uh, when they present. And they're not all little tumors. So like this is one of the guys who had his intracapsular enucleation. You know, this is a, uh, a decent sized parapharyngeal tumor and a guy who presented with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and, you know, so to preserve uh, function once removing that is, is, I don't know, I think quite good. And this is his post-op scan. So there's a tiny little, there probably is a little bit left in his case, right up at the top. But, you know, the mass effect is completely gone. He was quite old anyway. Um, and, his, and his nerves are all still working. Uh, so, so it basically that's a, 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 a dramatic change in um, what can be done relative to, or, or what is done relative to maybe a decade ago. So basically, uh, there's been a complete change in the approach for those uh, schwannomas. It's still appropriate to watch them for a bit and check that it is actually a tumor that's growing. But basically, if it's one that looks like it'll come out easily and with a high likelihood of preserving function, it's probably better to do that uh, early on. Um, and I would stress that, um, that the old school approach of basically cutting the nerve above and below the tumor is just completely kind of unjustifiable in the context of lower cranial nerve uh, schwannomas. Uh, and the same basically holds for the um, brachial plexus ones, but they're not normally done by EMT. Um, do we do, why don't we do the same thing intracranially? Well, it's not so easy when there's no epineurium because um, you can't really find that little plane. And, and the whole thing is just much harder. You can't sort of put your peanuts in and start sweeping things around and pushing on everything because it's all a bit squashy. Um, uh, and why don't we do that with facial schwannomas? Well, just because the stakes are that much higher uh, and that, you know, that would only be the, and I think with branching nerves, again, much harder to sort of try and find those planes and, and separate things. Obviously I appreciate the vagus has branches too, but not as many as the face. Well, at least not in the neck. Um, so there we go. Uh, so basically, I guess, I think the treatment of all of these kinds of schwannomas has moved on significantly like in the last 10 years. The treatment of each of them is different, even though the tumor is much the same and the risks of each one is slightly different. Uh, and the kind of overriding theme for all of them is that basically we try uh, and not sacrifice function uh, where possible. Wonderful. Thanks, Rupert. This is a brilliant talk um, and uh, a great overview of the wide ranging um, issues facing these patients and clinicians. Um, we do have several questions. I might kick off myself if that's all right. Um, I just wonder whether you could pass comment on the differences managing vestibular schwannoma in NF2 patients um, and also the role of Avastin in these patients. Um, yeah, so basically, so I guess the point I made was that the main concern about a schwannoma is really about brainstem compression rather than about hearing. Um, and that remains the case for NF2 patients. But hearing uh, is a bit more uh, pertinent if you have tumors bilaterally, of course, because, um, you know, uh, what, two ears are better than one, but the difference between one and none is a lot more marked. Um, so, uh, you know, we tend to be more conservative uh, with NF2 and perhaps, you know, hold off treatment. Often, they've, if, particularly if they've got bilateral disease, you don't necessarily know which ear's hearing is going to deteriorate. Um, you might hesitate to uh, 
uh, think, oh, well, this is the worst hearing ear, we'll do that one because you know they can switch around quite quickly. Um, and as you say, Avastin has come in with Bevacizumab, which is um, this uh, EGFR receptor uh, blocker. So it's a chemotherapy drug that they have as an IV infusion every few weeks. Um, which works quite well at stopping growth, and sometimes you see a reduction in volume. It's obviously systemic therapy, so particularly suitable for patients who have lots of different schwannomas. And often it's not just the bilateral vestibular schwannomas, they might have spinal or, or uh, you know, lower cranial, other schwannomas too. So, um, so if you've got lots of growing tumors, you think, well, here's one treatment that will treat all of them. Um, but it is uh, having basically chemo for years. Um, and some patients get renal failure. We have patients who uh, are on dialysis, having lost their kidney function as a result of uh, bevacizumab. So it's not, it's not like a, a magic bullet, but it has made a big difference um, to those uh, patients. Oh, you're muted. Thank you very much. We do have a few questions in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm, I, we may not have time for all of them, but I'll try and um, summarize them. We've got a patient who, um, uh, who has a vestibular schwannoma and their hearing on that side is affected. Uh, this clinician has said that they received radiation and the hearing continued to deteriorate after the radiation. Um, they're Which struggling. Is yeah, which is what you expect. They said they're struggling with a hearing aid. Um, and is there any way we can better preserve hearing in those patients um, going forward after their SRS? Um, no, I mean, there was a, a sort of school uh, of thought uh, where some more enthusiastic uh, radiation oncologists would say, let's irradiate patients earlier than we otherwise would in an effort to preserve their hearing. And I think it has been, and basically there are two sort of time, relevant time points when you're treating a tumor with SRS with regard to hearing. So one is that the tumor tends to swell around uh, four to six months post-op and a lot of patients will lose hearing at that point. But even if they uh, preserve their hearing through that stage and, and probably the majority do, um, they will continue to lose hearing uh, over the subsequent years, even if their tumor uh, involutes. So, the, the, the argument of or the, the sort of logic behind early SRS to try and preserve hearing just doesn't hold. Um, the exception being that, um, you know, you can still implant a patient who's lost their hearing post SRS, uh, you know, if they don't have hearing in the other ear. Um, but I don't think there's a, I mean, there's a team in Paris that are quite keen on uh, surgical decompression of the internal auditory canal, which, logically uh, follows you know the argument that schwannomas lead to functional deficit when they're in confined spaces but i've never uh, done that um one would sort of think once you've got there uh, to then just sort of remove the bone and stop would seem uh, a curious um thing to do Absolutely. but maybe that maybe you could decompress it and then irradiate it but that would just seem a bit perverse to me <laughs> once you're there um, one person has asked, um, what's your um, protocol for MRI surveillance? How frequently, how long do you follow people up? Uh, so so um, relatively simple one. So basically uh, intracanalicular tumors for first repeat scan at, at one year, three uh, one year scans, and then two two year scans, uh, and then a three and then five, basically. And, th and there's debate over at what point you stop surveillance. So at the moment, our protocol for younger patients is to continue with ongoing surveillance on a five-year basis once they've got to 10 years um, post. Um, but there are, so uh, Dan uh, Borsetto and the Cambridge group have done some work looking at the probability of a tumor which hasn't grown for years starting to grow. Um, and that is likely to lead to us deciding that we can stop monitoring patients after you know maybe eight years um it doesn't mean the tumor couldn't grow it just means it's no more likely that it, they would have a problem than anybody else um uh, uh, and then if the tumor is not intracanalicular the first interval scan tends to be at six months but they then follow much the same protocol <laughs>
Great. Um, what is the role of biopsies in facial and vagal schwannomas, one person's asked? Um, there isn't one. <laughs> Great. I mean, um, sometimes patients end up getting a needle biopsy, a core, uh, or an MA okay. on the schwannoma tends to hurt. I mean, I've seen people who've had cores. I mean, sometimes um, when you biopsy a paraganglioma, you just get back blood. Um, but normally it's a radiological um, diagnosis. Um, and uh, Ali Al Lami has asked, um, uh, what would be your indication to surgically manage an asymptomatic cervical vagal schwannoma presenting as a cystic neck mass? Um, and would encroachment to the jugular foramen uh, be part of your decision making? Um, yeah, I think if it's getting bigger, uh, and particularly if it's going up towards I th the jugular foramen, I mean, it just seems an awful lot harder to remove them whilst preserving function up in the um, jugular foramen. The whole sort of intracapsular nucleation thing is a little bit trickier if the tumor is very cystic or I mean basically it doesn't matter if the cyst is within the solid so most a lot of them have a little bit of necrosis in the middle radiologically they look cystic but some of them just have like a kind of a, a bag of fluid uh, coming off one side and, and and obviously it's very hard once that's popped the wall around the edge is, is not something you can really work uh, with so um but I would, I, I guess I'd just sort of, if, if the whole tumor looks cystic, you know, you could do a fairly sort of conservative um, thing. The problem with just popping a cyst is it does just tend to reform. So it, I don't know how easy that would be. And I think we've got two more questions if you've got, if you've got time. Yeah, um, so the first one is, uh, would you consider grafting the facial nerve in uh, a facial schwannoma that extends into the cerebellar pontine angle as opposed to the genicular region? And if so, how would you actually secure a graft in that sort of area? Well, um, yeah, it's you, you can't, at least I can't, stitch a graft intracranially, um, basically because the, the, the suture material tends to just cut out of the nerve, I think because it doesn't have a, a, a sort of vaguely robust epineurium. So intracranially, if you're fitting a graft, what you do is you, you wrap a little bit of uh, fascia, you put, you kind of approximate the two ends and you wrap a little bit of fascia around it and you put a little bit of glue on it and you kind of close their head and wonder whether uh, those two ends have floated apart in the CSF or not. Um, but I don't know of a better way of doing it. Um, if it's in the IAC, then you can be pretty confident that, you know, you, you can line up. So basically, if, if, if the intracranial bit is within the internal auditory canal, I think you can line everything up and, and sort of pack it, maybe a little bit of fat around there and be pretty confident they're opposed. But if it's in the um, cerebellar pontine angle, um, you know, I've done these things. I mean, sometimes when you're doing surgery, you, you realize that the nerve is divided and there's two ends and you sort of think, well, I might as well put them together. Um, and sometimes it works uh, astonishingly well, but that's not the usual result. Uh, and I think the usual result is probably just because those ends drifted apart, um, uh, you know, because it's all soaked in fluid and bouncing around. So I, I don't know if someone could, there might be something out there or that someone can invent that would do the job better. I think the last question is, we often talk about um, the risk of facial palsy after surgery for BS, um, but uh, what is the risk of facial palsy after SRS? For um... uh, Well, there is a risk, um, but it's, it's very small. Um, so the more common facial symptom that people would get is hemifacial spasm, which sometimes happens, you know, it's probably a couple of percent of patients get uh, hemifacial spasm, or maybe even five. Uh, when the thing's swollen about sort of four to six months. Um, facial palsy, probably, you know, maybe one or two percent. It's, it's rare. Um, I've seen it like immediately, you know, on the day, just mm -hmm. after the person came out of the machine. When the, uh, but that, uh, I'm trying to find the tactful way of phrasing this, that was perhaps suboptimally uh, applied 
radiation. Um, but if they've had it done properly, um, then the, you know, the, yeah, there's a risk, but it's it, it's small. I guess it's a bit like saying, well, you know, there's a risk of bad things happening, whatever you do. Great. Um, Rupert, thank you so much for your time. Um, really appreciated. Wonderful talk. And thanks to everyone for your questions. I think there's some really good questions there.